Well, hey there. Welcome back to another episode of Pitching Powerhouse. I'm your host, Jen Burson, and today we are going to answer a question asked in our Profitable PR Pros community by Avery Jones. Uh, Man, I can totally relate to this one. She says, does anyone have best practices on how to handle busy clients? And we interpreted that to mean (laughs) like unresponsive clients, which is kind of a nightmare for me and probably for you because you work so hard to get these feature opportunities for them that uh, are, you know, we know we have to be super responsive. It's what we teach in the pitch lab, be immediately responsive. You want to be as um, supportive and helpful to journalists as possible. And when you have a client that's quote unquote busy, which we know means they're not getting back to you, it's incredibly frustrating. So we have some advice from our community and from a member of my team, and then I'll share some of my best practices for how we handle this. So uh, we have Kim Alexander Livingood in the Profitable PR Pros community said, set up a regularly scheduled meeting so you're in their calendar in advance. And then Fallon Taylor basically said, busy clients are actually my ideal clients. I understand what she's saying here. We love clients that basically leave us alone. And I wouldn't say that it's that because they're busy. Um, we love clients that just kind of let us do our thing. Those are the ones that trust you the most. They're the ones that know they made a great decision in bringing you in. And so they're not going to micromanage you and they tend to pay higher retainers. So I know that, you know, you assume if a client leaves you alone, it's because they're busy, but we have found that it's because they're confident in their decision to bring you in as the expert. So, um, but what we're talking about here are these busy clients that are maybe not responsive. Um, And Miranda, who is my integrator in my business said, from her experience, busy clients are the best types of clients to work with because they leave you alone, which is kind of what we said, right? But she said it can be a double-edged sword for sure. If there are things that you need from them and they consistently won't get back to you in a timely manner, I recommend I recommend having some type of plan B contingency. And this may be something you put in your contract or discuss with them uh, so that you can proceed without letting them slow you down. If you can move forward without needing them to jump in, that's going to let you go and get those features and not let them kind of sabotage those opportunities because they're just not responding to you. So this really works well with things that your client needs to approve. So for example, if you've prepared something for their approval, give them a certain number of days or weeks to get to it. And then if they haven't gotten back to you, there's a mutual understanding that you'll proceed without this approval. That by them, it's almost like they're acquiescing, like, fine, I have no feedback or, you know, just hit the ground running because I have no changes. Um, It would be nice if they could say no changes, but assume if you want to move things forward that you just got to go with what you got. Um, But it's a trickier situation if you need a deliverable from them in order to proceed. So in this case, it's really important that you discuss expectations and explain to them that if you don't get what you need in a timely manner, their results won't be as good. So we like to set things up in advance. Um, I'm hearing from members of the community that they have weekly meetings with clients, weekly check-ins. Um, Tahira and Nelson are saying bi-weekly meetings um, and they work really well. So we have that as well. But these are last minute opportunities. I mean, I heard from someone in our group that she had an interview with the New York Times set up for her client and she could not get him to respond and give her a hard date that he was available and he wouldn't respond to interview questions. I mean, I'm like stressed out just thinking about it because My God, imagine how hard you work to get a New York Times opportunity and the client blows it. And then 
obviously they're going to come back and say some nonsense like, well, you're not getting me any opportunities. <laughs> you're like, hello, <laughs> you're blowing it. So here's actually my advice, because this has come up quite a bit in my 16 years running Generation PR, and we've kind of realized there's multiple phases when this comes up. So at the very beginning, when you start working with any client, but especially those who seem like they're going to be hard to reach, have a meeting where you establish expectations. So hold your clients accountable for their participation in your success by setting those clear expectations right from the beginning. So they need to understand that you it's a partnership, that you need them to be responsive in order for you to be as effective as possible. So um, you can even include a clause in your contract about client conduct expectations. We have had several members of our community say that they've included a client conduct clause in the contract because they have certain expectations of how the client is going to uh, support this partnership. And when they don't do it, it's, you know, if it's in the contract, it's essentially breach of contract. You can't do your job. Um, you know, the other thing is you can see if there's somebody internal at the company who will be your set point of contact right from the start when you start working with a new client. Because if you're expecting to hear from the CEO or the CMO, somebody with a very senior role, you might not be able to get to them. Or you might be low on the priority list. And we all know when an editor's on deadline, we want to get to them. Okay? So you can establish a point of contact that's going to be responsive, that's going to help you get what you need from the responsible parties in a kind of really timely manner. Um, and you know how to get a hold of that person and they understand that you might be working with some urgency. So in the beginning, communicate with clients how important responsiveness is. My God, it's like, how are we gonna do our jobs if we can't get what we need from the client? I need to hear from you. <laughs> like, hello, I'm over here trying to work on your behalf. Uh, so you have to really kind of convey that their role in this is to just get back to you um, and anticipate what you might need in advance so you have those things. So you want to anticipate making sure all of the assets you need. So that's images, um, an about uh, copy for the founder, for the brand. Um, you have all their marketing copy if they have it. You have their logos, lifestyle shots, you know, product shots, photography of like great uh, founder shots so that you can send that off um, quickly because sometimes you will get an opportunity to do an interview on behalf of your client. Maybe you have some responses. We're going to get into that. But it's going to allow you to just be immediately responsive. And I don't know if you can hear me. I'm snapping my fingers so that you can button up these opportunities for your clients. Um, you can always tell your clients when you reach out to them that it's important. And I have that in all caps. So you can show them you know that they're busy and you respect their time, but you're going to be reaching out when it's essential to be successful at your job. So you're not bugging them with every little minor thing. We come to our clients with solutions, not problems. So when we're reaching out to a client, it's because we are offering them either a solution to something, like here's the situation, we could do this and this is what that will look like or we're going to approach it like this and this is the outcome there and maybe let them decide. But don't go to them and just say, ah, you know, my hair's on fire. I have a problem um, without trying to solve the problem yourself. So you're letting them know, I understand your time's important and I'm coming to you because I do need your support on this one thing. Um, you know, and we also notice that you will start to experience during the courting process. So when you're trying to bring clients in to your agency and you're pitching new business to them and they're not responsive. And I have this going on with a prospective client right now. They were all hot and heavy. We need a proposal. Let's get your team on a call. And I gave some dates and we gave some follow-up questions to a discussion we had so that I could um, fill out the, not fill out, but create the proposal in a way that was going to effectively communicate what we can do for them. 
and what that would cost based on what they have in the pipeline for the next six to 12 months. Well, we gave them times so that our team was available and we gave them some questions and we haven't heard back. So my spidey senses are going off a little bit that this might be a problem client. If they're going to be difficult and non-responsive during the courting phase, imagine what they're going to be like when you're on board. So we, so this to me is a red flag and we actually have this really awesome comprehensive red flags training inside my program called the Agency Accelerator that's going to help you identify client issues before you start working with them. And I have had members of our program literally tell me that that saved them on so many, they knew what to look for and it saved them hours and hours of you know, wasted time with a client that was never going to get them what they needed, that was never going to be a good client, um, and a lot of heartache. It's that stress. Like, we want you to build a business you love and bring on clients that are, like, awesome, the best clients to work with. And if they're going to hold you up, you'll see that in the in the courting period, and that's a red flag. Pay attention to it. And that's in the agency accelerator. And I just had a member, Jocelyn, say it just saved me. So that is awesome to hear. It is really valuable. And honestly, I've worked on that content through experience the last 16 plus years of uh, running my business and reaching out to prospective clients. And just, you know, there it's just, it always comes up the same way. So keep that in mind. If they're not responsive during the pitch period where you're trying to sell your services, guess what? They're probably not going to be responsive when you're working with them. If a busy client um, is not responsive or if a busy and unresponsive client is what you're working with, you need to reflect on how that's going to impact you. So an example is if you pitch a client for an expert interview and you land that opportunity, but they don't respond or show up or they come late, they don't show up on time, You'll, you personally will not only not get the coverage, but you could potentially damage your reputation and your relationship with that media contact. And that to us is like, ugh, just an absolute like nightmare of a situation because you're working so hard. You get this opportunity. You know how excited. It's like getting a fish on the hook. You're like, yes, I, I got one. And the client blows it. And now that journalist... They're not going to take your calls. They're not going to take your calls. Who are we saying calls? We don't call anymore. They won't They won't respond to your emails. They're going to think, well, they have flaky clients, or maybe they think it's you. They don't know. So how can you combat that in advance? Before pitching time-sensitive opportunities that involve your client, let them know how important it is that they be responsive. And then also we do this little cheat. It's kind of like, I'll do this with my kids too. <laughs> so we're using strategies to wrangle my nine and 11 year old and also unruly, unresponsive clients. Give an earlier deadline than the journalist actually requests. So you want to build in this cushion time so that they actually meet the real deadline. Reach out to clients earlier if possible when you need something so that you can follow up and remind them. OK, so it's kind of like, you know, like we do this with people that are late all the time. You'll be like, oh, it starts at 1130, but it's really 1145 because, you know, they're always going to be late. You know, not naming names, but we definitely also do this with our children. So I think it's kind of ironic that sometimes we'll treat an unruly client in the same way that we treat an 11 and nine year old who don't want to put on their shoes. Um, and a follow-up from Jocelyn here, literally just declined a client. Those red flags were waving high, and I was able to feel good saying no thank you. I love that. Good for you, Jocelyn. That's so great. Um, so uh, also be more proactive in letting clients know what is on the horizon and that you'll need them to participate in order to achieve results. And you can always submit client interview pitches without the client's feedback if they don't get back to you in time. So sometimes we will, at the beginning or right as we start business outreach or outreach on behalf of the founder, we will interview them and we'll take copious notes and get all the information in their words. You can even do a Zoom and record it, transcribe it, 
ask them a bunch of questions that you think are likely to come up based on the pitch angles you're going to be doing for them to secure press for them. And then if it doesn't have to be like a real time interview and you get the interview questions from the journalists in advance, you can just answer them for the client. You have their words and you can either send it to them to run it by them or just edit it and send it off. And they, you, you have their blessing because you know they know that you're answering them based on how they would want to answer them, right? Um, and of course, it's a lot easier to answer one or two unknown questions than an entire comprehensive interview. So if you could get the bulk of it done and then go back to them and say, hey, I just have a couple remaining questions, get on the phone. Literally, like, do not wait for them to write you back. Get on the phone, get their words, do a Zoom, record it, transcribe it, or just take copious notes as you are listening to them. Because you know those clients. I had a client once that doesn't even email. She runs her entire business, I am not kidding you, over text messages. It's insane. She only responds to text and every single business transaction, we're talking like multi-million dollar transactions, all over text. And it's insane. So you have to know how, like if I sent her an email, she wouldn't even respond and I wouldn't even know if she got it. So I kind of figured out, <laughs> I kind of figured out that this woman is not on email. Like why even have an email? So if you text her, she will respond. She knows how to find things on text. That's her mode of communication. Totally not a typical way we respond. You know, we communicate with clients, but you got to meet them where they are. And we know some clients just absolutely will not give you a reply. It's like sitting there and they know it's important, but they're working on a million other things. So schedule a quick call. That's your solution and get them on. Um, if they don't get back to you in time, then just answer as best you can. It's better to secure an opportunity than to wait for the client and say it's your fault because they're never going to see it as their fault. They will see it as your fault. Um, another point is if your client consistently doesn't or won't respond to interviews or other types of opportunities, then you have to stop pitching them. You cannot keep pitching and letting these opportunities fall through and wasting your time, risking and jeopardizing your relationships, making you look really bad. So you have to let your clients know that since they aren't open to responding or they're really not available to meet a tight deadline, maybe just kind of position it as the kind of right now, like you're working on this launch or you're doing a rebrand or whatever, um, you have to let them know that because they're not able to meet tight deadlines that for now you can't pitch on their behalf for those specific opportunities where you need their input. And you want to make it a really respectful conversation. There's no blame. It's not a blame game. Just acknowledge how busy they are and that you don't want to add more to their plate that isn't a priority for them. Um, and if it is a priority, have them let you know and ask them the best way for you to convey to them that something is really urgent and you do need to get their attention and how much time is an appropriate window for them to get back to you. So if you know that they can't respond to you within 48 hours and you have a 24 hour deadline, you can't throw their hat in for that. Or you have to let the journalist know, I'm so sorry, my client is um, running a, a sales conference right now and they're not available in 24 hours. If you can extend to 48 hours, I can certainly get back to you. Um, let me know because we'd love to you know, get you connected to this, this uh, person. They'd be great for your article, whatever. Um, but always a respectful conversation. And you can always tell the client that if their schedule lightens up, and they do want these opportunities to be a priority, you can just switch up your strategy and add these pitches back in. But oh man, it just sucks when you're pitching and you're spending all this time and you're spinning your wheels because they're the bottleneck. They are the bottleneck. Like, guys, why did you bring me in here? Um, the most important thing really is preserving your reputation and your relationships and connection to these media contacts. I mean, this is what the client is paying you for. And obviously other clients are paying you for those connections and your industry expertise. So if one client sabotages that for you, um, yeah. And I just said, 
I said sabotage at the same time that Sally said, it feels like sabotage to me. Yeah, and Sally brought up, Sally's a member of the Agency Accelerator and the Pitch Lab and Agency Accelerator Plus. And she said, how about having another spokesperson? Absolutely, we have somebody designated internal in the company. One of our clients um, is a breast pump company and their internal spokesperson is a lactation consultant that sits on their board. And she responds immediately and she always has helpful advice and works in the client's company and their products. And it's so organic. And that type of person has gotten more traction. She's actually more appealing to uh, an interview or a story than having the CMO reply. And we know that we have her in our back pocket and we're getting tons of press for our clients having her as a spokesperson. So I love that idea. Have a designated person who you know is going to be responsive and you can leverage that expert and get immediate opportunities for them. Um, so that's you know really good. And obviously having somebody you can bring to the media with expertise is going to help you foster those relationships that you've worked so hard to build and you're showing them, I'm useful. I have a useful contact for you that's going to make your story better. Um, the other thing too is I always look at working with clients when we're in that sales phase as like a mutual courtship, <laughs> right? It's like dating, you know? you want to make sure that they're going to be a good fit for you as much as you're going to be for them. So I interview clients when we get on sales calls, I will interview them. When you vet your clients, you want to really think about how easy they're going to be to work with. And like I said, you don't have to say yes to every client opportunity. And in fact, you really shouldn't. I mean, think about um, Jocelyn, who said she identified a red flag early on and was really confident to say, you know, sayonara, not the right fit for me, but obviously no thank you in a very um, respectful way. And I sometimes like to have somebody else, if it's not truly a nightmare client, I have somebody that I can refer to them um, that might be a better fit. A lot of times it's a budget issue let's say, um, and I'll have somebody I know that, you know, does great work, but doesn't charge as much. Maybe they're a freelancer or something like that. But that like interview process where they're reaching out to you and asking, what can you do for me? You're vetting them the same as they are you. And you're thinking to yourself, how are you going to be to work with? Will I be able to get results for you? Will you support me in my efforts? Or are you going to be a bottleneck? I don't want to work with a client that is going to hold me up, slow me down. Um, I always say, you know, we operate like a speedboat when other big agencies are like steering a cruise ship. We're nimble. And if the client can't get us what we need and allow us to excel in how quickly we get results for them, then we're not doing what we know how to do and what our media contacts come to rely on us for. And that's a no-go for me. That's just a no-go for me. And Brandy here is saying it's very much a two-way street. Absolutely, yeah. And Sally is um, also saying here, Jen has some fabulous interview questions to ask. Yes, inside the Agency Accelerator, we have a whole module on sales calls and there's like a checklist of what to ask. Um, obviously, bring it up organically. You're not reading from it in a very like uh, robotic way. Um, it's just the things you should try to get out of the client on the call. Um, and it really helps you prepare so that you know what you're getting into. And you get as much information as possible to create the most compelling proposal possible. And then, of course, we have an entire module on proposals. Um, but it all kind of works together. And it this challenge of an unresponsive client if you look back during the pitching phase and the kind of proposal phase um, and the onboarding phase, you will see that there were signs that this is how it was going to be. Um, so the other thing is if you're ready to up-level your PR game and start worry working with higher end clients, we're actually working on an upcoming training that's going to help you to attract and retain those dream clients. 
So uh, yeah, I'm gonna drop um, a link here. You should really think about signing up for this. It's uh, our Path to Profitability training series. We have not offered this in over a year. It's getting revamped, retooled, bigger, better, better. <laughs> um, but this is all the stuff that is going to show you what you need to be doing on the front end of your efforts to fill your pipeline with the ideal clients you want. And when I say ideal, it's the ones that come to you for your expertise and are willing to pay you what you're worth because they're confident that you're the best at what you do. Um, and when you have clients that are confident in their decision, that don't nickel and dime you on your price, those are chef's kiss, the absolute best clients. So thanks for checking in today. I really appreciate you being here. I'm going to stay on for a second to answer any questions you guys might have. Um, if you guys didn't notice, I just launched a podcast called the Pitching Powerhouse podcast. Um, so what I'm trying to do, <laughs> if I was very like one-way street chatty, um, we're repurposing a lot of our live content and also creating new content for our podcast. Um, listen, I'm a busy mom and <laughs> we're doing the best we can. Um, but I just launched it like yesterday or the day before. If you listen in and you like what you hear, I would love for you to leave a review, let us know what you think, um, you know, anything along those lines. I'm trying to see how I can um, get you to the show. I don't even know how, I don't even know how to do it. Um, but how do I do this? Um, I would absolutely love for you to check it out. Um, but and then write a write a review if that if you're so inclined if you like what you hear but that's what we're going to be doing is kind of repurposing this content um but just know there is unique content members of our program we're interviewing we would love to hear i mean we have such incredible stories that we're going to be sharing it's so fun for me i've wanted to do a podcast for years and years and years i had um, a huge podcast. <laughs> I had a huge podcast network approach me many years back and they're like, we want you to have a show. Why don't you put a sh an idea together and pitch us? And I'm like, okay. And they're like, we see it as like PR and for moms and mom entrepreneurs and, you know, people making changes in their careers. And I'm like, perfect. Love it. So I created like a whole show concept. We did artwork. I recorded like two episodes interviewing people and I sent it to them and they're like, you don't have a large enough audience, like meaning my social media following. So they're like, we're not interested because we need 500,000 followers or more. And I was like, you came to me. <laughs> I'm like, why did you ask me for this if you knew that I didn't have a big enough audience? So I was kind of like mm, burnt out after that and kind of anti-podcast. But we decided that we wanted another way to connect with members of our community who maybe don't have time to sit and watch a live, who just want to pop in earbuds and listen while they're on the go, um, answer questions from our community, and they're edited down, they're little snackable 20 minute or less interviews or um, responses to questions. Um, and the very first episode, I think it's called episode zero, or it's like Meet Jen and the Pitching Powerhouse podcast, I talk about my why and what that means for you. Um, I've never recorded anything like that. Oh, good, Nelson, thank you. Um, I'm so glad you just signed up. But um, yeah, I uh, I talked about why, um, you know, what this means to me, what this community means to me, um, all of it. Um, just in reflecting, there's so many positive things that have come into my life since deciding to leave my job in law and start my PR firm and allowing <clears throat> my husband to quit his job and pursue entrepreneurship. And he just closed a huge deal this week. He worked for months and months and made it happen. And he's so happy and he's so just thriving and, you know, just seeing him where he was so burnt out in his nine to five. And it was more like, you know, nine to nine to eight. Um, and just leaving that security of a W-2 and paid benefits and saying, you know what, we can do this. We can do this together. And him seeing me and how happy I am 
as an entrepreneur doing my own thing. And also that my business was able to support us while he figured it out. Um, Nelson is saying, you have so much passion for this community. That's why I'm here every week. You are inspiring. Thank you so much. I do. I obviously do. Um, you know, and I just, to me, it's the coolest thing. I mean, Nelson's in Toronto. We are connecting with people all over the world. Like you'll have to see who I interview and where she's, you know, who I interview first on the podcast and where she is running her PR firm from. It's incredible. Um, so inspiring. And, you know, I just, it's beyond my wildest dreams. This community, we have people like Nelson that jump in seasoned veteran who share their resources, who are like, I was able to negotiate a raise in my contract when the client wanted to cut my fee. Um, oh, James. Hi, James. I'm tuning in from Puerto Rico. Awesome. And Sally, yeah, Sally's in our programs. I love the people here. Yes, Sally, it is Erin. You know where she runs her, her agency from, but maybe listeners to my show won't. And we have to like do one of those, like tune in to find out. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited. And obviously, um, you know, it's new for me and we are repurposing content, but guys, like we work really hard on this content. It is what everybody wants to know about. We find it in our community and what people ask. So like, we'll put it in another, in another medium, you know, so that people can access it. Um, but there is going to be original content on the podcast. Um, my cover art is super cute. Miranda did the whole thing. She did the show, the editing, the everything. I just show up and do what I love. Yeah, good. <laughs> Sally's like, mm, my lips are sealed. I'm not saying anything else. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, ooh, Brandy. I love that. I'm going to screen grab that. She says, agreed. Agency Accelerator has been a complete lifesaver for my business and truly helped me hone in as a PR pro. Mm, I love that. Brandy, I would love to interview you on the podcast. Would you be interested? And if so, let me know and I'll tell you um, how to make that move forward. I would love to chat with you. Um, you have been active and engaged in this community for so long, and I just have always appreciated you being here. Um, oh, you're the best, Jen. Well, I want to interview you, so let me know if that's of any interest to you. Um, but yeah, guys, thank you so much. My kids are back in school. It's so awesome. My older son is having some challenges. Um, and I got a call today. He broke his glasses. He can absolutely see without his glasses, but he flipped out. He used it as an excuse to say, come and get me. I can't be here. I can't see. It's like you go to school all the time without your glasses. Um, he absolutely can see. And he's like flipping out and I don't know. Okay, cool. Um, I'm going to put a, um, uh, there's an email. Um, please just send a quick email to Miranda and say, um, can I be on Jen's podcast? Jen asked me to be on her podcast and we'll get you like in the, in the loop. Okay. Um, yay. I'm so excited. So, um, yeah, my son is like flipping out and at least I have a direct communication line to his special ed teacher who's been so incredible. She sat with him in class, but I don't know, it's only like day four and he's already freaking out. So, um, oh, it's not agency accelerator. I'm so sorry. It's this. Okay. Sorry, 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 Brandy. No, go here. Sorry. Go here instead. Um, yeah. So, um, and also just wanted to let you guys know too, Nelson shared a really awesome resource in the group with our permission. He, you know, he asked and it's so awesome. He said he shared his corporate presentation um, that he couldn't upload as a PDF. So he turned it into a video and it is basically how he is able to show prospective clients um, that he, you know, the value he brings. There's testimonials, there's media outlets, he's secured features in there's all kinds of information on his expertise and how he's established in his niche. And he put that, and it's got music, so it's snazzy. So he put that in there for us 
to check out. And, um, you know, we always talk about how to convey value to clients. And that's a really awesome way. It's, I guess I would call it Nelson, a capabilities deck. We have a capabilities deck as well. Um, we usually use it and make it into the proposal. So it's like the two combined. But if somebody's like, show me your capabilities, we have one that's geared towards, um, Nelson, can you tag Sally in it where you posted it? We have one that's geared towards baby and kids and one that's geared towards beauty and cosmetics. And we'll just pull out the stuff around a proposal, like how we're going to pitch their brand and um, how much it's going to cost and how we staff their account. It's just, you know, who we are, what we're able to do, what we have done in the past, case studies, testimonials, all of that. Media contacts, certain media features that are like really great. Um, he calls it his corporate presentation PR pitch deck. Yeah. So, um, that's very similar. It looks very similar to our capabilities deck. Um, but yeah, it's really, really good. So check it out. And he was so generous to share that. Um, this is the best community ever on the internet, you guys. And you should see how it is in our paid programs too. Um, People are so supportive. We just had Barbara share, uh, what did she say here? I screen grabbed it because it was so good. She said, in Agency Accelerator Plus, which is like our coaching component to the Agency Accelerator, she said, hi all, wanted to share some exciting news and would that would not have been possible without the guidance and support from this group. I just landed my largest paying retainer client to date and in a niche that I've been wanting um, that I've been working on to build out my por portfolio. Thanks so much, Jen, for all you've shared with me and with the group at large to help me get there. This is just the beginning. Oh, I got chills. Barb, I love that so much. I'm so honored that you shared that with us. That's that's this community. So um, anyway, thank you guys. And if you could, if you're so inclined to, let me see how I can do this. If you could... Um, here, leave a review. If you listen, leave a review. I would love it. Even like five star, you know, any stars, just give it any stars. Um, and maybe a comment or whatever. That's it. I don't know if that link's going to work. It looks like it went on there twice. Just click it once and check it out. I would be so honored. Have a listen. Let me know what you think. Guys, thank you so much for being here again this week. Um, Nelson's saying, oh, I just re-signed a client that started out at three months, then renewed at six months, and now ongoing. Just renewed again for the whole year. Awesome. We love to see it. Good job, Nelson. That's so great. Um, great, guys. Well, have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you next week on the Pitching Powerhouse show. Go check out the podcast. Let me know what you think. Bye, guys. <laughs>